All right, so welcome everyone to our November 5th PD session in our fall series brought to you by the CSC. We're, uh, this is the third uh, of the fall sessions and we have three more to come. So I would uh, encourage you to have a, a look back through your email if you're looking for dates and times of the other sessions or just get in touch with me or, or with someone else in your AU team if you wanted to uh, refresh your memory on when the next sessions are coming up. I do try to send out a reminder between the managers meetings bi-weekly and the, uh, the virtual frontline services meetings that are on the alternate weeks to the managers meetings. But in any case, if you're having any trouble finding the links to any of the sessions, just, uh, just let me know. Or you can also contact Robin McKenzie. And I see Robin's online today too. Robin's our communications director. And as you know, our, our um, longtime conference manager. So since we unfortunately can't meet in person, Robin and I work together to try and establish some online PD. And uh, in addition to the six fall sessions, we had three back in June and we're looking to host another probably five or six in the winter. We thought we'd spread them out over a number of weeks and months instead of trying to, to, to replace the conference with a single PD day or two. Um, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat and also I suppose just, and I, I apologize for not introducing myself, I'm Barb Glass, I'm the Executive Director of the College Sector Committee for Adult Upgrading. I know most of you but I certainly may not have met all of you in person, although I think I've probably met pretty much everyone that's online today sometime in the last um, number of years. So welcome, really glad to, to see you today in the, uh, this virtual PD session. Uh, we are recording it, just in case you didn't hear me say that earlier. So please keep that in mind. I will send out the um, information to, to where you can access the recording later if you and or your colleagues would like to, to listen in. So I'm going to just in one moment share my screen and I'll be operating the slide deck while our colleague Carolyn Dobbin from George Brown does most of the color commentary. So bear with me for a second and I will flip over to my screen share. Okay. So I'm just curious, can you see the chat box on my screen overlapping with some of Carolyn's slide deck? Carolyn, can you see the chat box or not? Uh, not yours, no. Good, okay, that's what I was hoping because I do have to move it around a bit. And I'm assuming you couldn't see it because it's a different window, but I wasn't sure. All right. Yeah, looks good. Perfect. All right, so our topic for today is uh, the Academic Upgrading Student Engagement and Retention Survey Results. And this is a, something that um, George Brown and I and the CSC collaborated on. So we were really pleased to be able to work together as we often do on, on different projects with sometimes individual colleges or sometimes a number of colleges. George Brown wanted to undertake some, um, some information gathering and some research about remote learning environment and how things are going in AU regarding engagement and retention in particular. So by way of a little bit of background, um, Carolyn Dobbin created a, a survey, which a number of you I believe completed, and I distributed the survey, consulted with Carolyn a little bit on it, distributed it out to your, uh, to our, all of our 24 colleges, and we received, or Carolyn received a number of responses. So many thanks to those of you who were able to respond. Uh, we, were, we, we acknowledged and recognized that it was a pretty long survey and it was um, mostly narrative, so it did take some time to, to complete it. But I think it's safe to say we, we have some very um, meaningful information that we can share with you today. And so just very quickly before I pass things over to Carolyn, this is a, an overview of the content of today's presentation. We'll, we, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the process, which we, we did a moment ago. Um, we had some questions on the survey around the program structures and what was going on in orientation. We'll, we won't spend too much time on these two topics. That'll just be, a, as I was saying to Carolyn, you know, 
we agree that that's more like an FYI, because what we're really wanting to focus on today is more the, the challenges and strategies that are in the, uh, the second half of the presentation today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Carolyn to begin, and I will keep an eye as best I can on the chat. Feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along if you would like to do that. And I will, you know, Carolyn and I, I'll just kind of jump in if there's a question that seems to be, um, you know, relevant at the time or that we can't really answer in the chat. So I'll try and multitask and do those things as we go along. So Carolyn, why don't you go right ahead? Thanks, Barb. And a quick shout out to uh, Jimmy Bobimi, who's in our call, Jim Nielsen, because we worked really closely. We worked closely together to create that survey, and it's his technical expertise that kind of got it up and running. So thanks, Jim. Okay, so quick, quick overview. Uh, environmental scan, that was um, the intention originally. And it just was born out of a curiosity uh, in myself of what are other colleges doing, you know, and what could we learn in this process? So we sent out those 15 questions with the 14 respondents, thank you. And uh, some of the respondents were responsible for more than one area. And it uh, amounted to 10 colleges um, out of our 20, to 24 who uh, who responded so that was terrific and I'm going to be putting together uh, some information a report uh, by the end of November that you all will receive a copy of thanks Barb so let's move on to the goods so <coughs> structures uh, which was interesting to see fully synchronous with drop-in hours and blended and fully synchronous. So colleges are running with these three different structures. Now the blended, some had more synchronous, some had more asynchronous hours. The most common um, of all was the blended, more asynchronous hour structure. But what was kind of interesting about this is some of the colleges were offering more than one structure. So you might have a college that was uh, AU program that was offering fully synchronous with some blended options or mostly blended with some fully synchronous or some blended with some asynchronous offerings. So lots of flexibility there. So that's the structure. Uh, moving on to orientation. So again, it seems that three models kind of <laughs> developed, uh, have developed over time. One is the asynchronous one. And so that looks like sending students out modules to complete, uh, maybe PowerPoint slide deck or Word docs. The one-on-one -on -one tended to be more popular with the smaller programs, as you can imagine. And uh, some of the programs also offered some additional modules for students to run through after. And the most popular seemed to be the blended. And uh, that was a short synchronous session, you know, through Teams or Zoom, et cetera, and some additional modules that could have been just a few hours. One college had them uh, students working over the course of a week to complete different modules. And that was the most common was the blended. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the structure. Now we can look at the content of orientation. And I know this is not going to be a surprise to any of you. So it's more just an overview of the common topics uh, that were covered, whether it was asynchronous, like modular version or synchronous. This is kind of a blending here of all the content. Uh, and some of the, you know, kind of the, the unique pieces that uh, struck me and going through all the data was uh, one college has students doing a short Flipgrid video, which was kind of neat. Um, advisors, counselors, coordinators meeting with students even prior to orientation to kind of gauge uh, familiarity with things, comfort, challenges, etc. Uh, one college actually decided to um, have quizzes after each of their modules to just to make sure students were going through them. LMS training, so important. Uh, and, you know, even within the synchronous um, kind of uh, 
quick orientation blasts. Uh, people tried to incorporate little icebreakers, introductory activities, etc., which was nice to see because, you know, we're missing our community. So that's, uh, that's a little overview of the content. Now the last piece is what did we decide to change in orientation to make it even better? So a couple of iterations of orientations later, uh, the folks who are running asynchronous, uh, and I mentioned this just prior, now decided to um, incorporate quizzes and accompanying instructional videos. So they discovered that kind of the modular information was not enough for students. So the instructional videos actually quite helped. And of course, tech support, one on one. Um, the one to one orientations, people just said they're going well. And you can imagine that because it's so tailored, right? Uh, the blended orientations, uh, there were two types. One was group and one was uh, the one-to-one -one synchronous offerings um, with additional module work. So what they really discovered here is great to have the one-to-one -one for things like filling out forms, learning plans, and the technology. One college actually decided to move from blended to one-to-one -to, -one to better tailor um, the needs. Biggest issues always, right, is the lack of the LMS knowledge and filling out forms. So there you go. Those are the changes that people have brought about. So this is again, Barbara said, is a quick overview. So let's move into the different learning platforms here. So the most popular LMS uh, are Brightspace. That is the most popular of all of the respondents. Blackboard and one college had a college specific LMS and one college chose not to use an LMS. They're using uh, video conferencing instead. So that's that. Moving on to uh, the fact that all of the respondents but one said, yep, we're using video conferencing in addition to the LMS to create more of a classroom environment. You'll see the tools for student engagement. Uh, I'm sure there are more, and if you are using them, please uh, let me know. I'll add them to the report. And finally, uh, we have tools for um, teacher engagement or teacher use. And, uh, you know, there's a variety there from the video screencast o -matic, how to create videos, to kind of a fancy PowerPoint and articulate rise, et cetera. So this is a compilation of what everybody's using. So those are the learning platforms. Now we're gonna move on to a little bit more of the meteor uh, data. That Carolyn, I'm gonna interrupt just for one second um, yeah. to, to pick up on something you said. If, uh, if you didn't get a chance to fill out the survey and you would still like to provide some information, as Carolyn said, uh, she would love to receive additional information, even if it's just, you know, informally by email. We'll, we'll put Carolyn's email address in the chat near the end, or you can send the information to me and I can pass it on. Um, and that goes for any, any topics in, in, you know, that are within our discussion today. Um, if, you, if there's something you'd like to add you know, not necessarily a question, but if you'd just like to comment on something that you're doing that maybe we don't see here as we proceed or, um, or expand on something. If you're the college that happens to be referenced in the slide, we, did, we didn't make any reference to college names as we said we wouldn't, but um, again, feel free to, to provide some more feedback and information today as well if you, if you would like to. Okay, Carolyn, I'll, I'll <laughs> Thanks, zoom, on to, zoom on to the next one. And, uh, let's zoom. Let's zoom. If I get behind, you can just say Bing. <laughs> okay, that'll be our, our, our little catch word. There we go. Okay. All right, student challenges. Uh, as you can see, number one, and this was unanimous, tech issues. And none of this is going to be a surprise to you. We've all faced them with our students. So that's number one. Number two, moving on, Bing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See if you're paying attention. Very good. I was taking a drink of water. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, lack of digital digital literacy, and of course, that kind of goes hand in hand, right? Learning curve was immense for some of our students, and still is. The last one here is they're just not liking the online format. So 
impersonal. It's just the whole move from being able to see your teacher, your whole teacher, nothing but your teacher, you know, body language, um, not feeling as comfortable in maneuvering the online environment. Uh, a couple of the colleges mentioned lack of safety. And of course, the big one is lack of community. It's just not feeling it for the students. Okay, so let's move on. There are a few more challenges on the next slide. Uh, again, not a surprise to any of us. I'm sure we've all worked with students in the last number of months who are, you know, are not um, feeling as well even as they did when we were face to face and they had a place to go to. So um, general fear, this one came up a few times, not knowing what the future was going to look like. Mm -hmm. And so therefore not feeling the motivation or the sense of purpose. Another one that came up was routine. And of course, we know how important routine is to some of our students and the relapses that were, were happening for a number of our students because of the isolation factor. And as, as you can see from this picture, right? Kids at home and uh, jobs. And that's been a big factor actually, the number of hours people are working. Um, just overall distractions at home and missing the ability to leave home and go into a classroom setting. And the last one, the engagement, like participation, not feeling as comfortable, feeling more anonymous, kind of being a little fearful of, you know how you can sit in a classroom and see if a student has a question and you'll call on them? Well, that's not happening here as often. So those students tend to feel a little more anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think that um, it's a really uh, comprehensive list of challenges. I, um, and when I, you know, obviously I've read them before in the presentation and, and talked about them with many of you in our meetings and, and conversations, but when you see them listed there in the course of these two slides, it's pretty impactful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, and marry that with faculty challenges. Right? <laughs> Okay, so curriculum, of course, we know all of the extra time spent creating and just uploading new materials, that in itself, and the, the necessity of restructuring whole courses to try to fit them online and the structure. Sometimes it's in the timing, moving from day to night. Um, and this has been a big one, is digitalizing the forms. And I mean, like from textbooks, which a number of the programs have been using and trying to put all that material online. Uh, I'm not even going to go into EOIS and all the forms there, you know, but there's a lot of that going on and it's so time consuming. All right, next one is our teaching. And for those of us who teach synchronously, uh, some of us are splitting classes, synchronous classes, which can be uh, quite challenging, particularly because you don't have the same relationship with students. Uh, not being able to see them in class and know from somebody's furrowed brow if they're not getting it. Uh, not knowing where their skills are because you can't peek over their shoulder. Um, trying to monitor group work, but not actually being able to see the group work that they're doing. And the fact that some of our quieter students uh, disappear and uh, you don't know how they're feeling or doing at all. Next point, um, you just can't cover the same amount of material online as you can in a classroom is what people have said. Uh, skill building, therefore, um, you don't get to do as much of it. And our, our students with lower level skills struggle with asynchronous. And that came out loud and clear as well. So um, trying to manage that. Uh, a couple of surveys mentioned uh, just not being able to see colleagues in the office or students in the hallway and connecting that way. Uh, some students are not checking their email and so connecting with them, even their college email in particular, not being able to connect with them causes some problems. And that lovely ministry paperwork, collecting it. And uh, one college was really kind of struggling with um, testing and how to make sure that it was 
you know, it had its integrity intact. So that's the teaching piece. Now there are a few more challenges here. <laughs> Bing barb. And that is the tech. And uh, of course, we all know that we have had a tough time, some of us anyway, uh, onboarding with the LMS and the other platforms. Some of us needed um, lots of training and resources and that hasn't been available for, for all of the colleges and they have certainly commented on that. And just our workspaces, like I've got a guy, you know, putting in pot lights in my basement right now, bang, 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 right? <laughs> <laughs> while we're, we're going through our, our PD right now. So, and, and all of the accoutrement that goes with our workspaces. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Before we just uh, move on from the challenges, I just thought we could pause for a moment or two and, um, you know, just open up to any comments or questions that people have, you know, did those challenges resonate with you? I'm sure that they did. Are there, are there others that have now occurred to you? Um, any questions or comments around the challenges? student faculty teaching tech wise anything like that that you'd like to jump in and mention you can um just put it in the chat if you'd like or you can uh just unmute yourself and and join the conversation for a moment okay well i'll take the the um Okay, Lassite has, has noted in the chat, Luke from Lassite, the integrity challenges. Go ahead, Luke. Uh, thank you, Barb. Uh, well, the, one of our problems too is to make sure that uh, the, um, the exams that we are correcting are done by the student and it hasn't, uh, how can I say, there's hasn't been any fraud in it, then he didn't plagiarize or, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, way harder to monitor online than it was uh, in a physical space. Yes, absolutely, Luke. I think that's coming more and more to the forefront. And we talk about that in some of our biweekly meetings, actually often, um, both the managers meetings and the frontline services meetings. Um, so yeah, very, very true. Um, Mel from Algonquin, uh, you were noting not getting as much of a sense of where the, the students are struggling. Um, interesting about referrals. Do you want to expand on that, Melanie? It's fine. Like we have set it up so that our course availability is overlapped. Like our three teachers are all available in the same time slots and I'm available as their academic advisor in that um, portion. But students uh, drop in and um, connect with their teachers. But unless I specifically encourage a student to individually check in with me in the breakout room, it's a lot harder to get a sense of um, what supports they need in, in the broader senses of like, you know, in person, you can see if they're disheveled or um, the, the stuff about like not eating and things like that. It's a little more um, visual and the cues are there differently, um, but it's a little harder virtually to sense that or we also get emails from students that are very vague, like um, things are stressful at home right now, but that doesn't give me enough to go on. Um, so it's it's been a bit more of a challenge to have the deeper connection that would be easier to do one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, absolutely, Mel. I see a couple of comments in the chat around video conferencing challenges. Michael from Fleming and Joy from um, Centennial have both commented on that about you know, the students reluctance to speak or have cameras on. And as Joy comments, yes, I think faculty are spending a lot of time trying to create a community and increase that comfort level. And, um, and I appreciate Fleming's comment, listening and smiling, because I can relate. And these are common concerns. Yeah, they definitely are. All right, well, thanks so much for that input. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll just we'll move on now. And I will go back to my slide clicking. And I just want to say, Carolyn, what an amazing job you did um, uh, making this very visually interesting and appealing and finding some great pictures to support the content. <laughs> it's really, yes. really, really great. Okay, so work life balance. Yeah. Oh, there's a good one, isn't it? Um, of course, our own distractions and uh, all of the above. 
Um, and I'm sure you're all feeling this, the lack of boundary between work and home, you know, like I eat at the same table that I work at. So, right, and, and we're all suffering from that one. And um, a, a couple of the colleges said full-time staff working through the summer in order to create curriculum for, let's say, contract staff, but also for themselves, you know, and uh, that taking a big chunk. Uh, yeah. Um, and then finally, our, our own mental health and the complete sense of overwhelm uh, that some um, of the surveys really reflected uh, with just learning the tools and platforms and methodologies. And again, in some cases with minimal IT, which of course just adds to the stress level. This one I thought was really interesting, just trying to wrap our heads around um, how our lives have changed, you know, and, and a lot of us <laughs> would prefer to be in the classroom, you know, and, and seeing our students face to face, but, and, and just really having to grapple with that. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, COVID fatigue, and you know, that one goes without saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, every day looks the same. Okay, <laughs> so strategies to support faculty. So yes, uh, many of the colleges had some terrific workshops to help. Uh, a couple of the colleges paid their part-time staff for tech training and course design, which was awesome. Um, just time to deliver uh, and develop new materials and to pilot them, you know, so given time to do that. And in one college's case, uh, full-time staff was given time in lieu of all the work they put in in the summer. Uh, now staff training sessions offered by AU um, to help with learning the LMS. And I know, you know, smaller teacher groups got together to, they mentioned anyway, to practice as smaller groups, just helping each other and supporting. And then of course, regular faculty meetings and subject specific meetings where we can just talk. So that was uh, mentioned. Now, some of the other came more from the admin and management side. So just uh, additional help with from admin and coordinators, I'll, I'll mention to assist with the tracking and the management team just being more understanding because the workload has been so heavy. Uh, faculty being given equipment and laptops. I'm the recipient of one of those laptops, thankfully. And uh, um, one college created a virtual faculty manual for remote delivery, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, so those are yeah, some of the support. Quick little comment about that last bullet, the virtual faculty man manual for policies and procedures. That was, you know, that has been a bit of a theme from the ministry that whatever we're doing differently, we really should, um, like, especially in terms of uh, the program administration part, as opposed to so much the, the program delivery, which they're less interested in, but that we do have policies documented of how and why we're doing things differently in COVID, you know, whether it's the participant registration form collection or the um, you know, administering milestones differently or administering exit forms differently. Well, the ministrivia um the ministry has indicated you know we really should make sure we do have things in writing and that everybody in the organization understands them and applies them in the same way so that's just a little aside i will click again <laughs> thanks okay so let's look at the other side <clears throat> so these are academic strategies to support students that the colleges have implemented and uh, one college has an initial computer diagnostic. So to just assess uh, students' comfort level. And uh, if the comfort level is not there, there's an offering of a computer course before they even start their heavier um, content courses, if they wish. Some colleges are offering kind of smaller uh, computer workshops to help their students. Um, teaching videos, cannot underestimate that one. Uh, and if you haven't made them before, Screencast-O-Matic is just so easy to use. Um, and the students have, have commented on, on how much they appreciate that. Some colleges are able to give access to online labs and resources. Actually, a couple of the colleges have students coming in in you know, very, very small numbers and they're able to access those things. Um, and of course, the college help desks. So that's the tech. Now, course support, 
lots of one-on-one, -on -one, which the students are, are really appreciating. Um, one college offers math support, and this is tutoring, um, and offered by, by both teachers and students who are a little further ahead in the math programming. Uh, another college likes My Open Math as a support. Um, textbooks still being used, and there's a process there at the number of, uh, number of the colleges for students to, to access them. UDL, of course, and uh, lots of little um, instructional help with the LMS and the video conferencing built in actually to the courses themselves. Okay. So that takes us to flexible offerings. And you all know how much more flexible we're needing to be right now. So all the different models that we've talked about already um, and needing to adjust those expectations, not necessarily the outcomes, but how we get to the outcomes. Um, hard copy textbooks and booklets and one college uh, has booklets for their students and the students who don't have computers take pictures of the booklet pages they've completed and send them into their teachers. I'm, you know, ingenuity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. Uh, flexible assessment times. So <clears throat> let's say having an assessment available for an entire day. And of course, that brings into the question what Luke was talking about, about the integrity, but trying to find a balance between the two. Option for live lectures or asynchronous. And I mentioned this earlier on with the two, like kind of marrying two different models within the same program. So live lectures, maybe for an option and asynchronous at the same level as an option. And recording classes. And that one is controversial because, you know, sometimes people say, hey, you know, my students won't show up, but those recorded classes can be so helpful too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Carolyn, just to check in, we're doing pretty well for time. It's about 3.36, so I think we're on, on track for time. Good. Thanks, Barb. <laughs> All right. A lot of stuff. All right, so to carry on uh, with this theme, we're going to look at non-academic strategies. And you're going to see, um, afterwards we talk about engagement strategies. There's a little overlap here, but I'm sure you can understand why. And uh, Melanie actually was talking about communication, how important, how difficult it is, and how important it is. So here we go. It's number one on the list. Um, and these are some strategies. Surveys sent out to students. Uh, even prior to orientation starting um, and then class starting and the one-to-one -one connection that uh, counselors and advisors are making with students before class starts. Uh, the importance of those virtual office hours and uh, making them very clear. The clear and consistent messaging to students, a couple of the colleges talked about this and how they really try uh, to be consistent with timing, for instance, for registration, if you're running on more of a semester kind of basis, sending that message out at regular times. Uh, if a message is going out, let's say welcome messaging to students at the beginning, trying to make um, the messaging sounding fairly consistent even between the courses in a program. Um, increased opportunities for students to check in. So important because we don't see them in the hallways. We don't see them in class in the same way. Uh, and the corollary of that is more frequent follow-ups with staff and admin with students. Uh, one college, and I'm so curious about this one, has instituted an automated text service for students around things like course deadlines and um, other information, kind of a, a neat service. Uh, clear and active status and progress policy for students. So having an overall, uh, you know, kind of policy for students that can be shared um, between, um, you know, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. There was Matt. Okay. Okay. I'll, jump <laughs> I'll jump in with a question from the chat while you- Sure. sure. Uh, uh, so is there, can you cite an example of this point about more frequent follow-ups between staff slash admin and students? Like what does that look like? 
Yeah, now um, I can only speak to the information that was shared in the um, surveys, but uh, an example of that would be um, giving students heads up about paperwork that needs completing, around registration that needs doing, uh, that kind of thing from the admin perspective. And with staff, um, I can comment on that based on the survey. They said there's just a lot more uh, reminders going out <laughs> to students about uh, things needing doing, reminders about assignments, etc. So that, that kind of thing. And I would echo that uh, is always a, a, th a challenge in ACE distance you know, which has been online for 13 years, but it's still, there's such a need for different ways of communicating and reminding students of things um, when you're completely working virtually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks, Barb. Um, and just, uh, yeah, the active status and progress policy, whether you're posting that or whether you're sharing it in your individual classes. Um, multiple modes of communication. So, wow, this was a huge theme. And that meant uh, just finding a way to connect with students any way you can. So email, phone, Zoom, um, just making it work and being flexible around that. So that was probably the biggest category. Now tech was the next uh, as a strategy to support students. So um, instructions <laughs> and video instructions, perhaps tutorials, links to tutorials and um, you know, live demonstrations in class or prior to that, prior to class starting. Uh, and that feeds into the second working with students one to one. Um, okay, video conferencing, uh, of course, is so helpful. And I know even the, our counselors at George Brown are their video conference to death, but it really helps. <laughs> and also with filling out those dreaded online forms that students have so much trouble with. It's so helpful to them. Um, providing laptops, uh, whether they're gifted or loaned and MiFi sticks and that subsidy, the technology subsidy that uh, students can qualify for. Yeah. Um, and um, I just would, just on the note of that last bullet, the 100 per quarter, it may vary from college to college. This is, this is an example of one college's policy around this, but this is not a provincial uh, ministry policy. It, it's just one way that a college has chosen to, to use some of its training supports and has put the $100 per quarter limit in there to make sure that the money goes around. Um, quick question in the chat as well, Carolyn. Um, any discussion about, about actually putting course assignments and due dates into calendar appointments um, and reminders that the teacher sends by email, like an appointment for your essay that's due on, you know, the end of November 30th um, or to the calendar on the LMS. Did you see any use of that kind of appointment function? Um, you know what, Matt? No. No, nobody mentioned that, but what a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to talk about that in our next program meeting. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's funny, Carolyn, there's what we were doing, um, looking for a learning management system for our uh, e-learning, e-channel program uh, a couple years ago. One of the LMSs um, made a point of featuring that, saying that it, if they would have these uh, calendar things, and if you change it here, it changes on the course outline, or if you change on the course outline, it changes there. But I think it Short of that, I think that having those things is just an example of, you know, a universal design for learning feature. Like, you know, let's, let's really not try, let's make it easy for people to have it in their timelines and really get them to stick to calendars, both those things. And I think that there is a way to integrate the calendars on Blackboard and on Brightspace and Moodle to, to uh, calendar appointments on, on Outlook or Mail or whatever that people use for their calendars. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think that's a good point too, Matt. Hmm. Thanks, Matt. Okay, moving on. Bing, bing. Okay, information. Uh, okay, this is um, to harken back to the orientation, those modular units that give students a background um, and you know everything that's covered there. Um, one college created an academic integrity guide and uh, I'd love to know more about that too, <laughs> but good idea. 
Oh, and there's Kate I see from Fanshawe. Okay. Oh, good. She's responding to you, Matt. There we go. Uh, detailed instructions for the first day of class. And you know how nerve wracking that can be. <laughs> so in the welcome email. Um, now, whether this comes from coordinators or, or teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so carrying on in the same theme, um, AU supports. So um, some of the colleges are offering, if you do have a counselor, you're lucky enough to have a counselor, workshops on various topics, weekly emails going out from the counselors, and a newsletter with resources that uh, change from week to week, um, counseling or student advising sessions available to students, and of course the food cards and OCAS vouchers uh, that some colleges are able to provide. And as I mentioned, um, some of the colleges, a small number, actually have students who are able to come in in, in you know, ones and twos and threes. And so having that transportation support available for them, that's very helpful. Yeah, there's a small number of sites that are starting to have maybe a couple of students in at a time, whether it's for orientation or to pick up supplies or to fill out forms. So I can't say that it's widespread yet, but there's a just a few sites that are maybe just doing some very small group uh, activities, especially related to orientation and intake. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's some other, um, you know, I'm sure all the colleges make use of, of community-based support. So accessing the ones that are still accessible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the colleges mentioned just kind of ad hoc, picking up things for students, delivering things, et cetera. One college um, offered a, a distance hike for students who were interested or, you know, that kind of distanced get together to just see each other face to face at least once <laughs> with safety precautions. Um, okay, so we all have our college supports. Um, none of these I expect will be a surprise to you. Um, I can speak to the one at the bottom there, the Tutoring and Learning Center. Uh, we all have them at the different colleges, but I was speaking to our, uh, the head of ours, Michael Hill, and he's just, he's very busy. And our students are finding that um, they're actually accessing the TLC even more than they were when they were at the college because it's virtual. And it's so easy. So that's actually been a bit of a bonus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So these wonderful services. And let's move on actually to the last piece here, uh, student engagement. Um, now, this was very interesting for me to read and, uh, you know, just kind of sift through. Um, I kind of divided the first section into synchronous classes because it, it made more sense. And of course, there's more opportunity um, when you're teaching synchronously, even if it's a blended model, to practice student engagement. And we're all missing the community of, uh, of AU. So one, a couple of the colleges mentioned just really taking advantage of some of the Blackboard um, and Teams features, such as polls, such as whiteboards, um, bringing in some of the fun little apps like the Cahoots, et cetera, to make things just a little more engaging for students, getting them involved. Um, one college offers some holistic ideas. Uh, one teacher is inviting students to uh, kind of a five minute short meditation on Mindful Mondays. Another teacher offers kind of career focused videos just to keep the idea of there is a future out there going. Uh, another teacher offers Fun Fridays, you know, where everybody shares a meme on a particular topic, maybe. I mean, my God, we're, we're right in the middle of, you know, the U.S. election. So lots of uh, ripe opportunity here for sharing jokes and memes. Maybe a favorite video, etc. cetera. Uh, the idea that counselors and advisors can actually visit the classes uh, in the first week to introduce themselves or also to step in and maybe offer, you know, a short little workshop, et cetera, uh, just to shift the pace a little bit. Um, we all have our versions of uh, self-management, self-direction. 
and uh, those success strategy courses can offer something that uh, sometimes um, the more curriculum based uh, courses can't and uh, maybe a place to kind of land for students to discuss more openly about uh, you know their struggles. Um, the group work piece and you know it does take more time absolutely but um, many of the colleges talked who offer synchronous classes talked about how important this is that students still get to work together and they're not just listening to us talk and there's lots of little things that you can be doing within those group work sessions and screen sharing the group work after uh, to kind of create a bit more of a community in class. Um, a couple people mentioned, a couple respondents mentioned, um, taking some time up front before diving into curriculum to onboard students, to using the um, video conferencing tools, um, you know, such as the group work, uh, maybe creating a fun avatar, uh, or, you know, your profile picture, um, doing some, maybe a quick short intro, sharing your screen, those kinds of things before diving in so that you're not having to teach both skills at the same time. And uh, that seems to work quite well. And it's an opportunity for students to build community without having to worry about curriculum in the first couple of classes, let's say. Um, another is um, to, a, a couple of you have already talked about how difficult it is to know where students are at um, because we can't see them. So uh, one college mentioned giving more regular, but small sound bite homework assignments. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, thanks for joining. Um, to assess student progress and stay on top of that. So you're not just finding out how the student's doing, of course, when you've given them the assessment. Um, <laughs> this one came to um, me, actually I tried this with my students just having them read aloud. So uh, I did a little survey with them, a little anonymous feedback survey and just asked them what they, you know, what's working, what's not, what should I change or, or add. And overwhelmingly, I was actually quite surprised. They like reading out loud. So when this, the slides come up or when um, um, I've got an article up and they, you know, I don't read it, they read it and we do it in alphabetical order. So there's no surprises and they have the option to pass if they don't want to read. <laughs> that one surprised me. So I thought I'd throw that in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, any, any thoughts? I, I'd be curious to hear because I think we have a little time. Well, it's 3.52. Any additional thoughts around um, engagement when you're teaching synchronously that you'd like to share? All right, well, if you do uh, think of something, I'm very happy to add it into the report I'm writing because this is, these are sort of the nuts and bolts, right, of, of how we help students stay um, engaged and stay in our programs, which is what we want. So, all right, thanks. Think, um, considering the, the quick turnaround on, on moving to virtual delivery, I think this is an amazing list of, um, of things that people have already figured out in, you know, within a pretty short time of completely changing our mode of delivery in most cases. So, um, you know, yeah, we can, we can always add to the list if you think of things after the session that, that could go into the report or the, you know, I mean, it's a report in the sense of it'll be a compilation of all this information. Mm. I, I got a question. This is Matt from George Brown again. Yeah. Was there just, was there anything that when you got the result, the, the response to that previous slide, was it something that, 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 was there anything that came up as a surprise to you? And, and I guess if, if I was a ministry person here and they were looking at saying, you know what, it's a post COVID world, we got to make a recommendation for some sort of a short programming 
type of thing, it's going to be all online. What kind of learning would you have taken from this research that would say this is how maybe some some benchmark to to anchor a program's design in? Sorry, so Matt, can you just clarify the question for me? If if so, I guess the first part was if there was any surprises that you saw uh, from this piece, yeah. and then and then. I mean, the ministry is always looking for these types of recommendations and programs and our group is as well. But if, if, for instance, someone said to you that if you were looking to, if they were making some recommendations for a short-term program that's going to be all online um, mm -hmm. in the next six to eight months to be launched, what would, how, would you, how would you structure the design of it? What kind of best practices would you have in it? That, that's a big question, yeah. Uh... <laughs> the only type I know. <laughs> well, I think, it, I think it would depend sort of what your model of delivery is. So if you do have some synchronous, um, it certainly helps and uh, build community. So again, it, it depends on what your focus is. So if your focus is really on building community and you're able to offer some synchronous uh, in terms of st structure, it's nice to have a blended model. Um, if you can, if you can swing it, if your program is big enough, you know, um, I think when your program is a little smaller from what I've seen from the survey results, the one-to-one -one seems to work quite effectively. Uh, I, I just know from personal experience that when I'm having my conferences, my writing conferences with my students, we cover a lot of ground in a short period of time and I can really tailor it to their needs. Um, yeah, so that, that's a big question and it's a good question. Uh, I think what has come out of this survey is people have really been working hard to um, try different strategies. And you know, you throw it against the wall and you see if it sticks. And if it sticks, then you continue to use it. And, uh, but certain strategies work for bigger programs that wouldn't necessarily work for smaller ones and vice versa. And it, we're so diverse. Um, in the province that, you know, sharing some of these things will work for some people and not others, but some of them will work for all at the same time. So, yeah, I think uh, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I've answered it all for that's you. Great. But... Oh, you and I can have more ch chats about yes, this. Yes, we can. <laughs> yeah. Matt, I think that's a whole other workshop. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> we'll be talking, we'll be talking. <laughs> yeah. And I see another, thanks Matt. I see another question or a comment in the chat from, from Fleming. Um, in that they have been sending out class schedules, but thinking about after hearing some things today, adding some time into the schedule to uh, connect the students with the advisors to increase engagement and retention. Um, I think that's going to emerge as a best practice ongoing. I would agree. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Fleming. Okay, and our last slide here. Um, you know, it's tougher, of course, for the asynchronous uh, classes around engagement, but the engagement is kind of built in in that you get to connect with them one on one. But I loved this one. Uh, this one um, program says they have class meetings every two weeks. So everybody gets together, I think it's on Zoom, to celebrate achievements and to offer small workshops. So the teachers will actually take on, they'll host a week. Uh, like a session and they might offer, you know, who knows, a variety of workshops that can be fun, it could be game oriented, it can be learning oriented, that is away from the regular curriculum. Uh, these meetings also are an opportunity to check in with people and um, make referrals, etc. Look at challenges and just connect. So let's see asynchronous. And then the last piece, Barb, was just... Uh, our general. Um, one college offered, um, sort of went offline for a month to develop a curriculum uh, back sort of mid-March to mid-April. And uh, during that time, they offered um, a student events initiative where they offered a workshop a day, again, uh, mostly away from curriculum, more interest-based, where students could sign up through Eventbrite kind of cool and uh some of the colleges liked teams because of you know the badges and the praise and i know they're little things but they actually you know they make people feel so good our students mm -hmm. achievement letters right um i know we've we've some colleges have already been doing that but gee it's even more important right now online 
Um, and some colleges are offering some amazing workshops. Uh, um, not AU specific, but college specific and uh, just a whole range of topics. Um, peer mentoring as well. There's lots going on that way. And just, I'm going to end on this note, huge opportunity for communication and one-to-one -one help. That seems to be the biggest theme that has come out of this entire survey is how important that one-to-one -one help is. Yeah, so our last slide, Barb. This is just a little thanks to you, oh. everyone who's contributed. <laughs> it was uh, a lot, of, surprisingly, a lot of data. You guys did such a great job in sharing details, and I was so appreciative of that uh, and, and being able to compile all of this into one slideshow. <laughs> well, uh, many, many thanks, Carolyn, for um, walking us through all the data today and the information. I, I agree because I saw the raw uh, responses, which Carolyn compiled and sent it to me. There, there was such a rich uh, um, amount of information that, that you submitted for those of you that were able to complete the survey. I also feel like everything that, Carolyn, that you have pulled together here and through the survey is, um, it's almost like meeting notes from our, uh, some of our meeting topics in our informal biweekly meetings that have, you know, we, because we talk about engagement in some form almost every week. So I feel like all, a lot of information we've discussed, even if it didn't appear in the survey results has, has entered into this compilation that you've created. So it's, it's great. Um, and again, thank you, Jim, for helping with the initial survey design. That was really helpful. And uh, I think it made it pretty friendly to complete. And for those of you who were able to join us today, many, many thanks for taking the time. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is recorded. I'm about to stop the recording in a minute, but then I will provide you with a link to it if you want to listen to it at a later time. So any uh, last minute comments or questions? Lots of, lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, so again, Carolyn, thank you. Thanks to George Brown for collaborating on this and sharing your uh, information and uh, and expertise with us. Or at least um, I think we're I think it's emerging expertise for all of us as we continue to walk down this road of of remote and uh, remote not just remote teaching but remote uh, interactions with our students. So I hope you have a great evening. We'll sign off if there's no other questions, and uh, hope to see you at our next session. Thanks, Thank Barb. You. Thanks, Carolyn. Wonderful. Oh, thank, thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Matt. Right. And I see Carolyn's got her name, her email in the chat if you'd like to contact her directly. Mm -hmm. OK, take care, everyone, and be well. Yes, stay yeah. well. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I see you're still here. <laughs> Mr. Bobini. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he has multiple nicknames. <laughs> oh. There he does. Mm -hmm. Jim and uh, Phil are actually presenting at MTML. They're presenting, uh, mm. is it no, M? What is it, Matt? I don't it's MTML, yeah. Yeah, MTML. Um, I think they're presenting on Notepad, not Notepad, Padlet. Oh. Presentation on Padlet. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, they're both techies. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, we, Carolyn, we, I, actually, I must stop the recording now. Um, just a second, pause.